So, Caltrain in the Bay Area has fully electrified its system, while Metrolink in Southern California still relies on diesel locomotives. This raises the question, when will Metrolink electrify and is it worth the investment? Let's start by acknowledging that Caltrain's electrification project began being planned and discussed all the way back in the 1990s. It's not an overnight process, although we all wish it were. Recently, a petition circulated at the Metrolink Moore Park station and online urging board leaders to electrify Metrolink. Considering the LA area's over 18 million inhabitants, it's imperative to provide the best public transportation possible. I mean, look at this, I'm so jealous of the Silicon Valley. In today's video, we'll dive into the pros, cons, and challenges associated with electrifying Metrolink. Let's start with the positive aspects. Commuters on Metrolink's busiest line, the San Bernardino line, would greatly benefit from electrification. Currently, the San Bernardino line to Los Angeles takes an hour and 34 minutes. This time was recently reduced by 9 minutes due to schedule gaps, but some gaps still exist, causing trains to arrive early at certain stations. Therefore, we can estimate the commute time to be about an hour and 30 minutes. If Metrolink were to electrify, they could further shorten their schedule by another 20 to 25 minutes. Electric trains accelerate faster than conventional diesel trains, which would significantly speed up the journey. Now, some do argue that diesels are able to get the train up to speed fast, and yes, that is true, but electric trains do it way faster. For instance, Caltrain's electric trains cover a 51-mile stretch from Tamian to San Francisco, while Metrolink's San Bernardino line is 57 miles long. Despite making 10 more stops than Metrolink, which covers just a little longer distance, Caltrain completes the journey in 1 hour and 23 minutes, while Metrolink takes 1 hour and 34 minutes. Therefore, electrification would benefit Metrolink, as the trains would not only be more modern and fast, but reflect the ideal public transit experience in 2025. However, there are some drawbacks to consider. While electrification would improve the commute time and enhance the overall experience, it also raises concerns about the potential impact on service frequency. Some argue that 15-minute frequencies could be achieved with electrification, which would significantly reduce travel times. However, this requires careful planning and consideration of various factors, including infrastructure, capacity, operational efficiency, and the impact on passengers' schedules. And another side note, the longest commute on is the Inland Empire Orange County line from San Bernardino downtown to Oceanside, taking 2 hours and 35 minutes. Driving is 1 hour and 35 minutes if we were to fall along the route of the Inland Empire Orange County line, so Metrolink would highly benefit from electric trains. Here's where we get into the bad. Metrolink does not want to electrify, even though, get this, the California High Speed Rail Project would fund and pay for the electrification on four of their most busy lines. This is what Caltrain did. They took advantage of the funding, and it worked out really well. A Metrolink spokesperson said that it is complex for them to electrify because of coordinating with multiple track owners and lack of funding and cost. We'll discuss these issues next. Currently, most parts of Metrolink lines lack the capacity to support 15 and 30 minute frequencies. For instance, in October 2024, Metrolink introduced a schedule change that introduced 30 minute frequencies between Covina and Los Angeles on their San Bernardino line. The rest of the line from Covina to San Bernardino now operates on an hourly basis. This schedule change resulted in severe delays, prompting Metrolink to discontinue all Covina shuttle trains, except for a few. Darren Kettle, the CEO, acknowledged the inadequacy of the system for 30-minute headways and expressed his commitment to rectifying this issue. To compensate riders for the disruptions, Metrolink offered a 25% discount on monthly passes in January and February. It's important to note that while some parts of Metrolink's lines do support the 15-30 minute frequencies, others do not. This disparity is why Metrolink is prioritizing the extension of double tracks in various areas. Additionally, Metrolink should focus on converting most of its tracks to double track, which aligns with the San Bernardino County Transportation Authority's goal of transforming all Metrolink crossings into quiet zones and doubling the trackage for Metrolink trains. Caltrain's entire system from San Francisco to Tamian is double-tracked, enabling them to implement 15-minute frequencies at will. However, certain sections of the Caltrain system are quadruple-tracked for the Baby Bullet Express trains. 
Nevertheless, for Metrolink, on some lines, they may only be able to achieve 30-minute frequencies instead of 15. As of today, only a small percentage of the San Bernardino line is double-tracked, with most of it remaining single-tracked, with a few short sections of double-track near Covina, between Pomona and Montclair, west of Fontana, throughout San Bernardino, and a few passing tracks here and there, making the overall double-tracked percentage quite low. This goes the same for many other Metrolink lines, and this is where the challenge arises. Electrification is a massive undertaking, and despite Metrolink's aspirations, they lack the necessary funding. Consider Caltrain's electrification project, which involved electrifying a single system with 51 miles of track, not the 545 miles Metrolink currently operates. For Caltrain, overhead catenaries were $12 million per mile, and when you take into account Metrolink has 545 miles of track, yikes. Moreover, Metrolink doesn't own its Riverside line, a significant portion of its Paris Valley line, Orange County line, Inland Empire Orange County line, and Ventura County line. Union Pacific is already stingy about adding service, which explains why the Riverside line offers virtually no off-peak service. In fact, Union Pacific actually has a limit of trains Metrolink can operate on the Riverside line. Not to mention that BNSF and UP would have to agree to this. I highly doubt they would be receptive to electrification, which would most likely result in more Metrolink service. Therefore, Metrolink could potentially start small in phases, as the petition advocates. And on a side note, I did not start the petition. Additionally, Metrolink is exploring cheaper expansion options, such as hydrogen trains, which I believe are a poor choice. The Aero Line in Redlands is scheduled to launch a hydrogen train in late 2025. First and foremost, hydrogen gas is highly flammable, way more than diesel, posing a significant safety risk in case of a crash. Hydrogen trains also have faced technical and operational challenges in Germany, leading some lines to resort to using diesel trains as replacements due to unreliable hydrogen supply and frequent breakdowns. This has resulted in several German states abandoning plans for further hydrogen train development in favor of more reliable electric options. Therefore, the answer is electric trains. Before Metrolink moves ahead with electrification, it needs to prioritize doubling the track on more sections of its lines. Doubling the track is crucial for supporting higher frequencies and ensuring on-time and reliable service, especially as ridership grows. While Metrolink has several projects underway to add double track segments and improve stations, one question remains, why are these projects so limited in scope? Take for example the corridor through Upland on the San Bernardino line. The right-of-way in the area is wide enough already to accommodate additional tracks, so it raises the question, why aren't they pursuing a more expansive solution here? Similarly, there are already double-track sections in Montclair and West Rancho Cucamonga. Why not connect these two segments to create a more seamless, efficient route? By completing these types of connections, Metrolink would not only improve operational efficiency, but also lay the foundation for a smoother transition into electrification. Expanding and connecting these double-track segments should be a higher priority to maximize capacity and support the future of electrified rail. Oh, also, electrifying the San Bernardino line would also allow the Brightline West train to possibly run all the way to Union Station in the future. Metrolink's current diesel fleet could also provide extra service on top of the electrification until Metrolink is able to purchase more electric train sets. Metrolink should also consider the environmental impact of their current diesel locomotives. While Metrolink has made significant strides by using Tier 4 locomotives, which are designed to reduce emissions substantially compared to older models, they still produce some level of emissions, particularly in terms of nitrogen oxides. Tier 4 locomotives are the most environmental friendly diesel engines available today, and they offer a significant improvement over previous generations of diesel engines. However, despite these advancements, Metrolink still relies on older Tier 2 locomotives for part of its fleet. This means that Metrolink is still producing more emissions than it would be if it had a fully electrified fleet. Electrification, in this case, would not only eliminate emissions entirely, but would also contribute to cleaner air and a reduction in the region's carbon footprint, aligning with California's ambitious climate goals. The transition to electric trains would make Metrolink's service even more sustainable reducing its reliance on fossil fuels and supporting the broader push for eco-friendly transit options. Electrifying Metrolink is a momental undertaking, one that will require careful planning and significant investment. To electrify over all their 545 miles of track, it would take a long time, 
Given the size and complexity of the system, it's likely that the electrification process will unfold in phases. And even if it does happen, remember that Metrolink runs on multiple track owners, so that is going to be hard. If so, the focus Metrolink will need to be on the most heavily trafficked lines first, improving infrastructure and ensuring that the service can handle increased frequencies without compromising reliability. While the transition will take time, the long-term benefits of reduced travel times, cleaner air, and a more modernized transit network make it a crucial investment. The key challenge is not just electrifying the system, but ensuring Metrolink is equipped to handle the increased capacity and demand that comes with it. It's a huge step forward for Southern California, and with careful strategic planning, Metrolink can evolve into a transit system that meets the region's needs well into the future. At least for now, they should focus on 15-minute frequencies with enhancements to their infrastructure. If you're interested in signing the petition, which I didn't initiate, you can do so by clicking the link in the description. For more behind-the-scenes content, check out my Instagram account at everything.trains. And if you would like to see what a typical day of service looks like for Metrolink, you can check out this video here of the Metrolink Antelope Valley Line in action. Don't forget to subscribe for more videos like these. Enjoy your day and thanks for watching.